This is the Jaguar Enthusiasts Club podcast. Hello, I'm Wayne Scott and welcome to the first ever Jaguar Enthusiasts Club podcast, keeping Jaguar fans in touch worldwide. On this episode, we talk to racing legend Wynn Percy with a fascinating insight into his motorsport career. Richard West remembers the 1990 TWR Jaguar victory at Le Mans and Tom Robinson from Swallows Independent Jaguar answers all your technical questions. JECpodcast.com First though, we hope you're staying safe and well during this incredibly difficult time. The coronavirus outbreak is unavoidable and has had an effect on every part of our lives. Every corner of the Jaguar community across the world has been affected. So as we're not able to get out and about all that much in our Jaguars at the moment, what we aim to do is to keep everyone entertained and in touch via this, the Jaguar Enthusiast Club podcast. Helping me start things off is James Blackwell, General Manager of the Jaguar Enthusiast Club in Bristol. Hiya, James. Hi, Wayne. How are you? Very good, thanks. We're all in lockdown and it's uh, interesting times. So how is the club running through all of this? Because it's kind of business as usual in a way, isn't it? That is a very fair statement, Wayne, actually. it's um, Yeah, it is business as usual. So uh, both Graham and I have bunked to, to our homes and um, so we're operating from from there. Uh, we're able to take the phones, access all the uh, emails and memberships, etc. So it is business as usual. Um, the club runs with officials all over the the UK. So it's yeah, it, business as usual is a good way to describe it. So when uh, members want to ring the Jaguar Enthusiast Club, it's the same number, and they still get you. Uh, it's just you are trying to uh, talk to them whilst juggling entertaining the kids. I understand. <laughs> Yeah, that's one way to put it. Yes, yeah. So home is is now no longer just home. It is an office, a school, uh, a school room, a playground, a canteen, uh, and everything else. A conference room, as it was yesterday as well. So uh, yeah, it's uh, interesting, if not slightly entertaining and very stressful. Um, nobody should have to put up with me for twenty four hours, but uh, bless them, they're doing well. Well, of course, this is happening up and down the country and a lot of the people listening to this podcast will be experiencing the same sort of thing. But it has been particularly difficult on the Jaguar Enthusiast Club regions, hasn't it, James? Uh, You know, we're built around social events and people coming together and that has not been possible. But some of the regions are coming up with some innovative ways of keeping in touch. They are. It's been fantastic. It's um, it's amazing. People's ingenuity and the want to keep in touch and, and keep that uh, community spirit which the regions have built amongst themselves has it's been um, they've carried on and it's been really fantastic to see. As you say, we've they're using all the technology out there, Zoom meetings, WhatsApp. They're obviously engaging with social media anyway. So yeah it's just really good to hear and uh, i was talking to barry march of the somerset region uh, only yesterday and um, he was saying that they've got a, a zoom meeting for that for their region and and it, they've done a quiz night for it as well so um, yeah it's it's really nice um so i suppose that the bonus would really for them is they can uh, the people at home can enjoy beer without worrying to, about you know driving there's none of none of the uh, soft drinks they can stay at home and, and have a beer whilst they partake in the in the quiz night or, or however they want to interact with their regions as well so really really good to see yeah no designated driver required when you're drinking your own living room in the first place so that's all working out exactly. nicely <laughs> and of course we're keeping in touch through a number of various different mediums of course jaguar enthusiast magazine is continuing to be printed as normal and is landing on doorsteps very soon for the may issue uh, that's all excellent and packed full of brilliant articles and lots of news keeping everyone in touch as well isn't it and the nice thing is actually it's, it's a good opportunity so it's no surprise we're getting members calling us and they're, they're, they've got the time to work on their cars they're, they're cleaning that they're doing things that they've got time to do but nothing else to do really i suppose in some respects so uh, you know for us it's a really good opportunity of delivering the technical expertise just helping our members work on their cars safely and correctly uh, during this time as well so yeah the magazine is going to be continuing as normal which is good news 
And I know Nigel Thorley, the editor of the magazine, is keen to hear from anyone who is working on particular projects during COVID-19. So drop Nigel a, a little note, take a few pictures, write up the story. It could be you in Jaguar Enthusiast magazine as well, which is a great way of uh, getting involved. And of course, we've got Friday Spotlight, the e-newsletter that goes out every Friday. And there's been some really interesting stories on that recently as well. There has been. One of the really good things about sort of being involved in the, the Jaguar mark is, is how much much is out there we always said that when we set ourselves the challenge of a, of a weekly newsletter actually the, the content wouldn't be the problem we'd be trying to work out which to put in and which one would, would really make a difference and you, you've got you know some really good examples at the moment you know with, with JLR um, although they've they've closed and they shut the factories down there's, there's still some really positive stuff going on out there well that's right this was a story that we broke on the spotlight newsletter last week and it's really lovely to see all sorts of different industries sort of doing their bit to battle the pandemic but jlr in particular have donated vehicles to the uk red cross there's 57 vehicles including 27 new land rover defenders this was from their press fleet basically the story is that they had these cars lined up ready for the Defender launch and uh, the press fleet was ready to do all of the test drives for the magazines. Of course, that wasn't able to happen. Uh, so they've taken those cars that were all ready to go and they've donated them for use in delivering medicines and crucial supplies up and down the country. And it's been a lovely story to read. It's up on the uh, JEC website at uh, jc.org.uk at the moment. You said these, these are things we really liked in terms of being able to let people know the good work that other businesses are doing you know as well as jlr as you say there are all sorts of industries getting involved in trying to help get us through and uh, that that was a really good story to read and of course our regions uh, a lot of them there was a lot of talk about how they how each of them are looking to um volunteer for the nhs and, and get involved helping as well well uh, from the good news and positive stuff that you can read on the website at the moment jc.org.uk we have a postponement of the big event of the year for jaguar fans of course the summer jaguar festival it was supposed to happen between the 15th and 17th of may at newby hall but it's now postponed isn't it james Yes, you know, we work really hard in the background. There's, there's a, a really vibrant events team that try and puts all of this stuff on. And it was difficult and um, slightly complicated by the fact that it's not just, uh, you know, us and, and a field. We, we were working with different partners and, and different people. So to try and get us all on the same page and agree a date was, was difficult as well. So as you say, disappointing that we had to, but you know the right thing to do and then uh, once we managed to get all the parties on board then uh, we finally agreed a date and um, you know warners you know they're operating business so we had bookings etc to try and work with them to find a date where we could try and accommodate as many of our members as possible because they've been they're, they're taking a huge number of bookings for us and that weekend we'd, we'd have the uh, the hotel solar so it's purely for our members that weekend so um they've worked hard with us to make sure that we can still offer our members is, is what they had already paid up to receive just on the on the new date um please don't try and, and ring them at the moment they are exceptionally busy but they will get to you what's the process with the day tickets that they'd booked for may are they being carried over they have indeed yeah so if you've booked a ticket and you you can still make the dates we'll do all the hard work and we'll just make sure that we send you out the ticket um, nearer the time for uh, to come along and enjoy but Sunday the, the 23rd um, the same with the camping well of course we have the features like the moving motor show all planned as well so it's going to be a great event and fingers crossed 21st to the 23rd of August you can be with us for the postponement dates of the summer Jaguar festival for 2020 how can people keep in touch with all of the latest developments on these new stories Friday Spotlight um, is, a, is a really good place. If, if you haven't signed up for that, then go log into the website and subscribe to that now. And then obviously we'll bring you the, me- the best you can in the, in the magazine, uh, usually in a bit more detail as well. Excellent. Of course, I uh, must mention that on jec.org.uk are all of the coronavirus updates from the club as well. So all of the events that have been postponed or cancelled or moved around the calendar all of the updates and indeed advice for you are all on there as well and uh, hopefully we'll all be back to normal as soon as possible with you on that one looking forward to getting back and seeing you all again out there and of course uh, seeing the cars back on the road so uh, yeah wayne thank you very much you have you stay safe yourself and uh, everyone else stay safe 
Memories of Motorsport. Richard remembers on the Jaguar Enthusiasts Club podcast. Richard West has enjoyed a lifetime in motorsport. This week, he looks back at his part played in the 1990 Le Mans victory when Martin Brundle, Price Cobb and John Nielsen took the win in the famous silk-cut liveried TWR Jaguar XJR12. Obviously in 89, we got roundly trounced by Salva. You know, we, we went there with enormous intent and Salva, Peter Salva and his team did the most amazing job. And as we walked out of the circuit that night in 89, I was walking out with Tom and he said to me, listen, this is just not happening again. And he said, you know, the preparations for next year start tomorrow. And literally that, you know, we all went back to Kidlington and within a day we were talking about Le Mans 1990. Everybody up the ante, Tony Dow and his guys came over, Ian Reid, the engineer and various others came over from the States and were working on the number three car that eventually won the race. Tony very cleverly had, you know, done some deals with Goodyear to bring some special rubber over. Tom was incredibly focused on winning Le Mans because he knew just how important it was to Jaguar and to the sponsors and partners of the team at that time. And I think what it was, it was the closest to being in a Formula One environment in sports cars that I ever experienced because the whole team from literally two or three days after the 89 defeat, although we were focused on world sports cars, IMSA and the Japanese sports car championship, you know, we were in every corner of the globe at that time. There was this centralized program of being successful at the moment. Tom, Roger, Alan Scott, Jaguar themselves, there were some quite heated discussions about drivers and driver uh, combinations, you know, not unpleasant, but, you know, really what I would describe as um, meaningful dialogue about how we got the best out of each team and what the strengths and what the weaknesses were. And when we got there, everybody was supremely confident because we'd also suffered a tragedy in 89. One of our engineers, uh, engine guys, uh, had been killed earlier in the week prior to the 89 race when he was crossing the road coming out of a restaurant and it left a very dark shadow and a lot of people felt that 90 was a way to try and a pay respects to him and also right the wrongs of 89 and i remember two particular things um big john nielsen is an incredibly tough guy and john would do double stints and things in the car whereas a lot of people would struggle with those because the cockpit com- the temperatures in those cars during the day was very high John was an incredibly, he's an incredibly strong guy. Martin was very tactical. Tom, you know, was there overseeing it all the time. And I remember there was a point, I think it's about 4.30 in the morning, when you go in your lowest ebb, you know, everybody's out either in the champagne tent or at the circus or, you know, behind the beer wall the other side of the circuit. And in the team, you're just trying to stay focused. And Martin got out of one of the stints. And as he walked past me going to the motorhome to, you know, change his overalls and freshen up, he just looked at me and winked and he said, we can win this one. And that was it. And I just suddenly then, I felt like I hadn't needed to sleep. You know, I just thought, you know what, we're going to win them all. And for me, I hadn't been there in 88, obviously, because I was a McLaren guy in those days in F1. I thought, wow, the world's most difficult sports car race, you know, we stand a chance of winning it. And we've already won Daytona this year with Tony Dow's team, you know, in, in America. And I think at the end of it, when it was all over, I was trying to round up sponsors and people. There's a very famous picture of Tom throwing a hat off the winner's rostrum, and he's up there with Price Cobb, John Nielsen, Martin Brundle, Alan Scott, Roger Silman, and Sir John Egan, and a few other luminaries. And as I went to take the leader of Silk Cut at that time, Peter Gilpin, up the back steps, the French security guard stopped us going up the stairs. So you can imagine the guy who sort of contributed millions of dollars to the program wasn't too happy. Anyway, I took him back down to the pits and um, we photographed him with the winning car with Martin and the trio and everything else. And as we were walking out of the circuit, Tom just looked at me and he winked and he said, that's what it's all about, Richard. He said, we're here to win races and we're here to win championships. And now you're a part of that industry. And that's always stayed with me. And a few weeks later and he was asked to go to the Royal Mint and have them cast a bronze medal which Tom gave to everybody who was part of the Le Mans winning team and we each got one of these bronze medals and on the front there was the two cars you know a really nice picture and there was a nice inscription from Tom inside and when they arrived and everybody was given one it just made you feel incredibly proud and I've got mine and it again is something I would never part with for any amount of money because 
you know, you don't win Le Mans very often. Just to finish the thing is an achievement. And for Jaguar to win it as many times as they have done in their history and, you know, twice with Tom, staggering achievement. And quite honestly, out of all the motor racing experiences I've had, walking out with Tom that evening back to the car, totally exhausted. You can't beat it. It's a fantastic feeling. You're listening to the Jaguar Enthusiasts Club podcast. Sharing the passion, sharing the knowledge. All your questions answered with the Jaguar model experts. Well, time to answer your technical questions now on the JEC podcast. And on the line, I have from his very workshop, yes, uh, Tom Robinson uh, from Swallows Independent Jaguar. Hiya, Tom. Hi, Wayne. How are you? Very well, thanks. So you are our technical expert for this episode. It's good to have you along. Tell us all about Swallows, though, and uh, what's happening during this outbreak. How are you coping? So, yeah, we're an independent Jaguar specialist based in Somerset, just south of Bristol. Um, We specialise in general service and maintenance and repairs, and we're also heavily involved um, with our Swallows Racing brand in motorsport and performance. So um, with COVID-19, we are obviously on lockdown at the moment, um, which is actually kind of a little bit of a break for us to catch up with some of the long-term projects we've got here. So um, we're still pretty busy with even though things are as they are. Brilliant. And of course, you can get in touch with Tom via the JEC podcast as well. Just go to the contact page at jecpodcast.com and leave your voice message there. It can be you asking Tom a question on this podcast, or you can use the contact form to write one out as well. And our first voice message, Tom, comes from Gareth Davies. I drive a 2017 F-Pace 3-litre V6 twin turbo. And the issue is that during lockdown, the warning light has come on to say that the exhaust filter is full. Now, generally speaking, when I've had the warning light before, I drive at 40 miles an hour or more for a period of 20 minutes and it clears itself. But um, because of lockdown, I've been unable to do that. And the warning light has come on and the, the car is now... Um, in limp mode, so it's not driving properly. While it's in limp mode, am I causing any further damage if I drive the car on short journeys for shopping and um, things of the like, or am I going to cause problems for when I actually do get it to the dealership? Okay, um, thanks, Gareth. That is a really, really good question, to be honest. Um, And it is a little bit of an awkward one to answer without running a couple of basic checks on the vehicle. Now, first things first, I personally would recommend not to drive the vehicle before having it checked. Now, there's a couple of reasons for that. Now, with you describing that it's in restricted performance, which would mean the DPF won't actually regen on its own at all. So there is a number of factors um, that the car needs to meet for it to carry out a regeneration purpose. So um, there is a potential that you could cause damage by driving the vehicle. Um, So I personally, although it could be a bit awkward, get the vehicle recovered to a dealer or to an independent to get that assessed before you go any further. Well, thanks for that question there, Gareth. And uh, Tom, this might be a a problem that comes up with a number of more modern Jaguars during this period because they're being used on such short journeys. What actually is the problem? What causes it? So um, that is a really good point, um, Wayne, absolutely. So when you're driving on short journeys with the DPF, now the DPF has to meet a a range of criteria on the engine management system. So um, there's various points that it needs to do. Now, for the DPF to carry out a regeneration, um, it will actually increase um, the well actually delay the fuel injection to incur, uh, sorry to increase exhaust gas temperatures to basically burn off the accumulated soot buildup in the filter. Now, if the car doesn't do this on each journey, basically that filter builds essentially more and more and more, and it will get to a point where the filter is essentially too blocked and it meets a pressure limit for the car to self-generate. So basically, it'll just put a red fault light on and it will not be able to carry out the process. Now, providing you get the car to a dealer or to an independent like ourselves before um, you block it too much, it doesn't need replacing. There is ways and means for us to actually 
force regenerate these cars or send the DPFs away to be cleaned, if that makes sense. So essentially, if you do get it to go to red, try and get it to a garage as soon as possible to avoid any other damage. Now, one of the, the sort of more serious facts that can happen if it's constantly left is you can get um, excessive oil dilution because of the amount of diesel that's being put into the system. You will get uh, some of them remnants into the oil system on the car. It can affect the lubrication of the engine. So it is pretty key to, to do that. But if it is an amber warning light that comes on the car, it is safe to carry on driving. And I would recommend to sort of carry out uh, an average speed of about 50 miles, 50, 60 miles per hour, sort of 15, 20 minute motorway run should carry out a DPF regeneration for you. Okay. Thanks, Tom. Uh, on to another one of our audio questions left at jcpodcast.com now. Good day. This is uh, Tony Brown. I own a uh, 1989 3.6 XJS, which I've owned for uh, since 1993. The car's been kept in very good condition, but has now just shown a couple of blisters on the uh, driver's side and uh, the near side wings near the headlamps uh, they're very small blisters but i would imagine that's indicative of rust underneath um is there any quick fixes on these or would you recommend that it goes to a panel shop for a, a thorough evaluation okay tony no problem so um, my personal recommendation for this would be to take the car to a body shop there is a number of potential quick fixes that, uh, fixes that people can do, but being realistic, you are always best to take to body shop and for them to physically take the panel back to metal to remove any rust areas. Otherwise, I'm afraid you would potentially just delaying a further problem, if that makes sense to you. And I guess the trouble is, Tom, with that, if you can see rust on the outside, there's bound to be more lingering behind. Not to scare Tony too much, but it's often a bigger problem than is actually visible, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely, Wayne. What you can see externally, um, which is what I was saying, it is always best to, to sort of take it back to the metal and see exactly what you're dealing with there. And ideally, you want to sort of remove any of that rust or cut away any of that corrosion. Otherwise, I'm afraid it, it does eventually just come, come back in, in surprisingly quickly as well. So it's best to deal with that as properly as you can. Um, it will, unfortunately, cost a little bit more, but it would definitely last um, foreseeable future, if that makes sense. Well, Tony, it's a 3.6 XJS. It's worth it. Spend the money. That's what I would say. Um, thanks, Tom. Uh, Absolutely. On to another couple of questions that have been sent to us on the contact form then. Uh, this one from Steve Watson via the JC Facebook page. Steve Watson asks, is the Mark II shell the same as a Daimler 250 V8 or are they interchangeable? So I will be honest with you on this one. In my experience, it is with, more, with the more modern Jaguars, but from what I understand, the actual body shells are the same. Um, but I am happy to stand corrected on that point. From my understanding is that Daimler added extras to the vehicle. So most of the external pieces were cosmetic differences. Um, obviously, they used the, the Daimler 250 V8. So there was modifications to some of the subframes, etc. But I believe the physical body shells, other than the suspension components, are the same. Excellent. Another one via the contact form from Jeff Harding, who asks, on a 2007 X-Type, how do I turn on the sound for the sat-nav? Yeah, no problem, Jeff. So um, we actually get asked this one quite a lot because it's, it's not the easiest navigation panel on the, on the X-Type with the, um, the sat-nav unit there. So um, there's a couple of things that I'll just want to, to point out. So one thing to check is that the sat-nav hasn't been muted if there's no sound at all. You can check this by pushing the nav button on the right-hand side, then click nav menu. Then in the bottom right corner, you should see a mute or loud option. So just firstly check that. If that is all um, obviously on loud, etc., and you are getting sound, is what you need to do is you need to push the menu button on the right-hand side of the LCD screen. Then on the top right hand of the screen should be the volume presets. Now, once you've gone into the volume presets, there then should be three options. The very top bar is for your sat-nav volume, and you'll just see a simple plus or minus either side of that. So obviously just increase it, and you'll see the bars move up on the volume. That should cue you a problem for you, Jeff. 
Not the easiest thing, Tom, to be doing if you're driving down the road. You best pull over for that one, I reckon. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You're best sort of navigating your way through the panels park because <laughs> it's not the easiest way to navigate through it. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, no wonder he asked. It sounds complicated. Um, right, another question. This one from Andy J, who wrote to us to ask. My XJ40 has smoke on startup from cold or after it's been parked up for a while. I've been told that this is hardened valve seals. Is that correct? And how do I rectify this? So, Andy, from what you've described there, I would be of the same opinion that it would potentially be the valve stem seals. Now, um, valve stem seals do essentially have a controlled leak of oil to allow lubrication on that valve stem. Um, but over time, um, they obviously dry and perish, etc. So, is all that is happening there is is oil is seeping from the cylinder head the top of the cylinder head when it's parked overnight and leaking into the cylinder there which is why you're getting excessive smoke so um it's quite a common problem on those to be completely honest with you and for the age of the vehicle um i wouldn't be too concerned to say it's quite um quite normal but unfortunately the only remedy to um to this is to replace them now um, i'm sure quite a few people agree with me on this um you do have to remove the cylinder head to do this so it is worthwhile putting a couple of other, other points in place that um, you do end up doing quite a few other jobs whilst you're in there, if that makes sense, regards to sort of replacement gaskets, uh, reshimming the cylinder head. And there will probably be um, quite a lot of carbon buildup on the leading valve seat. So it would be worthwhile cleaning that, relapping the valves, etc., and then shimming it all accordingly with new valve stem seals. So that would be my recommendations on that one, Andy. Uh, my XJ40 did exactly the same, Tom. It was always a bit smoky when you first started it up, but uh, I think the only thing I would add is that if you are going to do that at home, for goodness sake, don't try and lift the cylinder head off by yourself because it's <laughs> blooming heavy, isn't it? <laughs> It's surprising. Yeah, it really is. And, and that just emphasizes the point. It's worth spending the extra time with that while it's apart, Andy, and going right the way through the top part of the engine while that is apart. Um, it would be a really good job well done and, and sort of look after you for the foreseeable future, if that makes sense. Great stuff, Tom. Uh, don't forget, you can ask your questions via jecpodcast.com. Go on the contact page there, and uh, you'll see the little voice recorder button there. Really easy to use that to get you on the show and ask your questions to Tom Robinson from Swallows Independent Jaguar. Or, of course, you can use the contact form, and uh, Tom and myself will be answering more of your questions in the next episode of the JC podcast and uh, Tom whilst you're in lockdown I understand you're also keeping yourself busy with Maguire's with uh, some more episodes of Tom versus Dale what's coming up with that yeah absolutely so um, I don't know if um, everyone's aware of exactly what that is but Tom versus Dale is a YouTube series run by Maguire's car care um, so both Tom and Dale basically build a show car um, to compete against each other through the summer show season so We've lucky enough um, been able to team up with Dale and he has chosen to build a track orientated Jaguar S Type R, which is which is obviously brilliant. Um, so Dale's vision is to utilize the retro S Type looks uh, and build a modern twist on a classic Mark II race car. So it's been great for us as a company to be involved in this project and we've been sort of involved with a number of large brands that have contributed to the build. So the build is still well underway with us here in lockdown um, and you can follow the progress on the social media channels or via Maguire's YouTube channel. Now, I believe there's an episode coming out um, this Sunday um, and that was the last um, series of, of work we did on the vehicle, which was unfortunately before all of the lockdown kicked off. So that will be going live on Sunday um, and there should be another one two weeks after that, which I believe will be installing some Tarox brakes. Um, and we're doing a full installation guide on that video. So if is, anyone is interested, make sure you give it a follow, but it's, it's pretty good. Brilliant. We look forward to the next episode, Tom, and we'll, of course, share those via the Friday Spotlight email uh, that all Jaguar Enthusiast Club members receive as well. So until the next time when we have a load of questions for you, Tom, I'll let you get back to the workshop, and thanks for joining us. No problem. Thanks a lot, Wayne. I'll speak to you soon. You're listening to the Jaguar Enthusiasts Club podcast. Join the Jaguar Enthusiasts Club now at jec.org.uk.
Well, to most Jaguar fans, our first guest on the podcast needs little introduction. Win Percy is a Jaguar racing hero to many of us, having won multiple touring car championships, uh, including winning Spa in the Group A XJS, uh, plus being a front runner for TWR Jaguar in the Group C cars, where he survived a frightening crash at Le Mans. And uh, Win, firstly, thanks for joining us on the Jaguar Enthusiast Club podcast. Yeah, no problem. You're living in Spain now, I understand, and I talked to you during the big coronavirus outbreak. How are things in Spain? Because it's been particularly hard hit, hasn't it? Spain generally is very hard hit, yeah. We're in Andalusia, which is uh, right down the bottom, not far from Gibraltar. Um, Andalusia is a big state of um, Spain. Like you've got cities like um, Seville, Malaga, Granada. That's where the biggest concentration of the the infections and, and sadly deaths are. Marbella is also hit, which is down on the coast here. But we're just above the coast, um, close to a little, used to be a village, it's now a small town, Minas Pueblo. And as yet, as far as we know, there are no reported cases here. So we're very fortunate. Well, that's good to hear, and we hope that you stay safe and uh, stay in and stay away from it all, Wind, uh, and hopefully uh, enjoy kicking back now and looking back over such a successful motor racing career, but a career that started from quite humble beginnings in Dorset, and it kind of all kicked off with an apprenticeship at your local garage, didn't it? What are your earliest memories of those days? I thoroughly enjoyed it there. Um, I've always been mechanically minded, I assumed and believed, because the farm was my life, my father worked on the farm, that I would end up on the farm. But um, as soon as I was old enough to get a motorbike, and I started to go into a local garage, the owner who ran the place by himself, the workshop, wanted extra help. And he said, look, I'd like to take you on for a five-year apprenticeship, which I can give you. I think you do very well. And I immediately accepted that. Absolutely loved it because in those days, even the journey to Dorchester, which was the local town, was too far to go just to get parts all the time. So you you literally learned the basics of everything, uh, relining brakes, relining clutches, white metalling bearings, uh, piston rings, boring. You know, you did everything, rebuilding gearboxes and axles. And I I think in later years with uh, motorsport, that helps me an awful lot, that mechanical knowledge and sympathy. That, that's what I believe anyway, and owners of cars have, have agreed that that's been the case. So I'm pretty pleased with that beginning. So how did that apprenticeship in the garage turn into motorsport then? Was it something that you sort of discovered as a hobby, or how did, how did that come around? Those days, those five years, there were two cars that really I loved. Um, having them come in for petrol. He didn't come in for repairs or anything. One was one of the local squires who had a Goldwing Mercedes. And uh, with those early Mercs, you had to do, I don't know, 20 miles or so to warm the dry sump system up to get it to operate without just turning the engine off. So he used to pop into the garage. And if we were quiet, Norman, the boss, would say, go on, go for a ride. So I'd go with this guy while he warmed the engine up. And... Um, that was an amazing memory of that beautiful car in those early days. But the other one that really got me was a 140 that used to come in for petrol. And uh, that was the first Jaguar that I ever took interest in, not that I ever touched it. Um, so, yeah, those were the memories of it. But the love of motor cars and then starting to, well, I belong to, I started to belong to a local uh, motor club, Woolbridge Motor Club, uh, which I stayed with for many, many years. And um, it was in the days when night rallies were fun and there were there was nobody on the road, um, apart from the odd drunk leaving a pub at night. So <laughs> they used to almost close public roads in the country where you had a start point and a finish point and timed. And um, nobody ever bothered. It was quite amazing, really. They were good fun. And I started off with a Mars 1000. Don't laugh. And then I eventually ended up with a 105 the Anglia. I went through different cars, but those were the ones that got me hitched on motorsport. <laughs> the Anglia, I actually went down to Weymouth Stock Car Stadium one Wednesday, so that must have been about 63, because I'd already met Rosemary, my later wife. 
And um, they were short of entries that night. And they said, would anyone like to take their road car around for, say, three laps against the clock for a small trophy? And a few guys turned up all of a sudden out of the uh, spectators. Jaguar, I remember, a Zephyr, Zodiac, all sorts of, oh, Rapier. And I had this 997-105 Anglia. Anyway, I absolutely loved drifting it and having fun with it. And, um, yeah, I, I was fastest that night and won the trophy. So I then went into a, a popular sport then, which was autocross. And um, the Anglia started off, as I said, 997, 1000, 1000 cc. It progressed to 1200, 1350, 1500. <laughs> and then it was into a five-bearing block, 1650 cc. And then it progressed to a twin cam head. Um, Piper cams, all sorts of fun in those days to make them go quicker. <laughs> and then there was a series called the Players Number Six Autocross Championship, which was a, a countrywide thing. And um, that got me started in sport. Um, but that was pure off road stuff. You guys are more interested probably in the racing side of it. That didn't start till a little bit later. Yeah, because you were in your 30s by the time your sort of first paid drive came along, weren't you? Yeah, that was the trouble, really. I mean, I never dreamt that it would turn into anything other than just the, the job as a mechanic. And by then, I had my own garage business. I'd taken over a, a, a fuel station with workshops and that. And in Weymouth, we were the sort of local place to bring your performance cars, Mini Coopers and that. I, I was Krypton tuned, so I had all the Krypton equipment there. And I loved that side of it. I loved taking the engines apart. Um, and then um, <laughs> along came one of the best cars I ever had, which was a Datsun 240Z. Um, the local dealer out at Lulworth didn't have a, a very visible showroom. And my forecourt in Weymouth was very visible. So he used to dump half a dozen cars, new cars, a time on me and I could sell these little Datsuns like you wouldn't believe in Weymouth. I mean, they were like eight to 900 pounds brand new cars and um, hard to believe these days. And then the Datsun 240Z really attracted me. And it wasn't long after I bought a used one uh, that uh, I read in Motor News about this this guy up at Harbury called Spike Anderson that modified one and called it a Super Samurai and uh, oh, the performance was amazing, etc. Phoned him up, took mine up to him. He did all the work, Wolf Race wheels, Triple Webbers, different cam, um, his cylinder head, uh, different shocks, etc. And I started doing hill climbs and sprints. And it was a, at a hill climb, um, at Gersten Down or West um, Wiscombe. It was one of those two that he saw me. And he said, you know, you're very good. He said, next year, we're going to build a big Sam, a Samurai to go sports car racing in the British Modified Sports Car Championship to take on the works Porsches. He said, would you drive it for us? And I said, yeah, I'd love to. And that year, unbelievably, we did something like 14 rounds of that championship. We won the class and beat AFM Porsches, Nick Fall especially, And it's hard to believe that years later, I was talking to Bill Mack from Dunlop. He said, did you run Dunlops on your Z all those years ago? I said, yeah. I said, that was a good set of tires. They lasted all year. And he said, don't be silly. I said, sorry? He said, don't be silly. What have you just said? I said, they lasted all year. He said, they did all those races, plus practice and qualifying, all year. And I said, yeah, honestly, we didn't have the money for any more, or Spike didn't. <laughs> he said, you are joking. He said, if you changed those tires even a few races at a time, you'd have been seconds quicker. I said, yeah, I know that now, but I didn't then. To me, a set of slicks was a set of slicks. Anyway, um, that progressed. That was 74. 75, Toyota offered, or with um, Samurai, offered um, Samurai to run two cars in the British Touring Car Championship. 
and they were 1,600cc Toyota Sleekers. The first race was at Mallory Park, and Bernard Junette was in the works of Enger, Jenny Beryl, uh, Drawn, and um, Stan Clark in Alfa Romeos, all sorts of different cars. It was amazing fun. Mm -hmm. It poured with rain. Typical, I love the rain. And I won it. And Pride and Clark were the importers of Toyota then. And after the race, they were congratulating me. And they said, you had a wonderful race with that guy in the bigger class, two-liter two Escort. And I said, yes, I didn't know who it was. I don't know anybody in this type of racing. And uh, with that, this guy, rather stocky guy, pushed his way through the crowd, little crowd of people congratulating me. And he said, uh, Wynn's a funny name. I said, yeah, well, it's Winston, but Wynn. And he said, I understand this is your first race, uh, first, a touring car race, or first racing. I said, yes. He said, well, he said, you're very good. He said, one day I'll have my own racing team. And shook hands and walked away. He said, you'll be my driver. And I said, who the devil's that? And they said, the guy Tom Walkinshaw racing that escort for London Sports Car Centre. And that's how I met Tom. Pivotal yeah. moment then. <laughs> it's been a life of those sorts of incidences, really. I mean, I've never gone out and tried to get a drive, uh, unbelievably. I've, to the best of my knowledge, never been sacked or laid off. And I've never, ever wanted to drive it. They just come along. It's, it's amazing, really. I've been very, very lucky. Tom Walkinshaw, being the man that he was, and I've interviewed a number of the other uh, drivers for him over the years, um, he, he must have given you some quite difficult terms to begin with. Uh, tell us what that early relationship was like. Yeah, I'd, I'd actually driven, so not for, well, for him in the BMW County Championship uh, two years. Um, that was great fun. And um, they ran all 14 of the cars. I actually represented Avon, um, and, and a driver represented a certain part of the country. It was great fun, all identical cars, and it was great fun. TWR ran them. Um, but my first drive was with the Mazda RX-7, and he spoke to me at the end of 79, and he said, right, I'm ready for you now. I want you to drive in the British Championship next year, British Touring Cars, and the Mazda RX-7 is the car you will have. And I want you to win the championship. You should be able to. It's a good car. If you don't, I won't pay you. And that'll be six grand for the year. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> so um, that's the agreement I shook hands on, believe it or not. Um, I wanted to drive the car. That continued on in um, 81. And luckily again, I won the championship that year, so that was the two years. I mean, the, the RX-7 was an amazing little car, it really was. I love the rotary engine. Um, but then in 82, he um, asked me to do something else for him, and that was to join Chuck Nicholson in an XJS for Spa 24-hour race. And that was the first year that Tom had taken an XJS to Spa for the 24-hour. For the and funny enough, he always said that it takes three years to be sure you're going to win a 24-hour race. And if you think about it, we went there 82, 83, and it wasn't till 84 that we actually won that particular race. Mm. So, he went, And I think you'll find it was exactly the same with the Group C at Le Mans later, in later years. So mm. there's some sense to that as well. What were your first impressions of that XJS when you first got in it as, as a car? I... I enjoyed it a lot of people don't because he wouldn't have power brakes he wouldn't have power steering he wanted everything to be as free of technical problems as we could but it meant that you drove it the way he liked driving and that was catching hold of it and making sure you were the boss and he could do that i mean he was that he was strong enough to do that a lot of drivers weren't and didn't like that but you could still even if you got hold of the thing and and manhandled it you could still settle into a lovely easy pace with it i love doing the long races with it and i certainly wasn't as strong as tom but um he was funny actually because the first spa that was i say 82 um <laughs> i was with chuck so that wasn't a problem so it was 83 before i actually drove tom's particular car 
And we were at Silverstone one day, and he said, right, I'd like you to see if you like my car. Give it a run. So I said, okay. He said, you've got three laps to see if you're any good or not. I thought, well, that's a bit odd, but okay. Because why would he even think about me if he didn't think I was all right? But he wanted me to drive his car. Well, I got in it. And to be honest with you, I'm quite well, I'm tall and a bit skinny. Tom is quite robust and short. So the seat was like driving a NASCAR, really. The wheel was almost in your chest and your legs bent all angles. But So I did the three laps and I'd done a deal with one of the mechanics that if I, as I stopped and went to get out of it, if the time that I did was thumbs up, that was okay. If it wasn't particularly good, thumbs down or no no acknowledgement. Anyway, I got out of the car. I was getting out of the car and Tom put his, uh, the mechanic put his thumb up. So Tom said, well, what do you think of my car? I said, well, it's, it's, it's great. I said, I, I love driving it, similar to the others. But I said, is there any chance we can adjust the seat? And hardly before I finished saying it, he said, Winston, if you want to drive my car, you'll drive it where the seat is. <laughs> so he hadn't quite finished the sentence. And I'd slithered back in the seat. And I said, you know, it's actually quite comfortable. <laughs> Well, join me for the next episode of the Jaguar Enthusiast Club podcast where Wyn Percy talks us through the era of racing with TWR and the silk-cut Jags at Le Mans, tells us what really happened during that frightening crash on the Mulsanne Strait in 1987 that he was lucky to walk away from, and tells us the true story behind Tom Walkinshaw's premonition of his death. All coming up in the next episode, so join me then. Until then, see ya. This is the Jaguar Enthusiasts Club podcast. Subscribe for new episodes at jecpodcast.com.